All right, welcome back to another edition of the Movement Optimism Podcast uh, on multiple channels. You can also watch it on video on YouTube and Instagram and all that stuff. Um, this is just me, no guests this time. We're going to do few, a few more of these so we can hammer out some narcissism uh, and some research. And I wanted to talk about one uh, small little topic, probably a debate that I've had for at least 10 years around uh, regional interdependence. Uh, which is basically the hip bone is connected to the knee bone is connected to the foot bone but because we're physios we make it more complicated than that Uh, really saying if you have a foot your glute works if you have a knee your glute has to work if you have a shoulder it works with the elbow you know it's all connected here so you know 20 years ago people were advocating if you have uh, knee pain you should probably do something at the hip uh, and since that time, I first read that by uh, probably Shirley Sermon back in like 2001, but I'm sure people were saying it uh, before that. Her impetus at the time always goes back to the kinesiopathological model, would be that if you have knee pain, you're probably having valgus or hip adduction. And the assumption there is if you have hip adduction, it'll increase the load on the knee. So what people would say is like the knee is the victim of the hip. That's, that's the basic premise of, uh, of regional uh, interdependence. And it led to the good idea that we should train more uh, than just at the knee when someone has knee pain or if someone has a hamstring strain, you know, cause they don't work in isolation. Of course, you're gonna train the hamstrings and build them up. But you could also argue that you should be training at the calf, you should be training the glutes, you should be training the spine, all those things. If someone has neck pain, you know, we wouldn't just do exercises at the neck. You could also look at the thoracic spine. So it's a good idea. Uh, It does have pragmatic uh, research behind it. Where the debate lies is around what exercises you choose uh, at a distance. And this is where I've always had these arguments and two just uh, you know, came up really recently uh, in the past uh, two, two weeks. Most recently, uh, yesterday, <laughs> was with uh, Mark Shepard and not much of a debate, I'm just quibbling here. They put out a, a nice paper that I like. It's a good, it's called the Patient-Centered Hypothesis Framework advancing clinical reasoning reasoning and musculoskeletal pain management. And it's a nice paper. Frameworks are hard to do because we know that pain is complicated and complex and there's all these factors involved. And once you try to write that down, that, that's hard and create a framework. And they, they actually do a, a good job of citing other frameworks. So it's, it's nothing, nothing really new. Um, and frameworks are sometimes helpful for people. So one of their components here is this idea of like, consider regional contributors and coexisting conditions, right? And this is the idea that again, regional interdependence occurs. If you have a limitation in thoracic mobility and someone has neck pain, that you should go and address that thoracic mobility. And so what my criticism is, is that this is this idea of a false precision, right? So if someone has knee pain, you would check the hip. That's what people want to say. You got to go assess what the hip is doing uh, and see if the glutes are weak, you know, if the glute need is weak, if they have a limitation in hip internal rotation. And the assumption there is that if there's this so-called deficit somewhere else, it's somehow relevant and that will tell you what to do for your exercise selection for regional interdependence. You know, and so it's 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 limited in my opinion, and so and it's not surprisingly research based. What I am advocating for is the belt and suspenders approach to rehab, which simply says if you don't want your fan, your pants to fall down, you wear belts and suspenders. You you train comprehensively. So the reason that you would choose hip exercises when someone has knee pain is because they have knee pain and they have a hip. That's the simple argument. Because the research doesn't show that someone needs to be weak at the hip 
or someone needs to have a mobility deficit at the hip to, to benefit from the exercises at the hip. You could also make the same case if someone has knee pain that you should be training at the foot and the calf. They don't need to be weak there. They don't need to have a lack of dorsiflexion, you know, whatever it happens to be. So the, the, the issue here is people don't like this because, you know, what people will write me is like, oh, Greg, okay, what's the point of doing an assessment? Why don't you just give everybody a strength and conditioning program? And I'm like, well, yes, what's wrong with that? Or the other argument, people will say, well, you're just going in there blind. You're just choosing exercises blindly. And my argument is that that's, this is the false precision. Is Just because you found a so-called deficit, you're deluding yourself and thinking that that sheds more light on what you're doing. Because we don't know why these exercises are helping people with pain, right? You can't say that someone has knee pain and they have so-called weak glutes, that it's because you corrected that weakness that they got better, right? So the idea here is what if those exercises for the glutes helped for another reason that had nothing to do with getting that person stronger in the glutes? Now you can have a subset of people who don't have weak glutes, they have knee pain, and if you don't give them the hip exercises, maybe it decreases their chance of getting better, right? Because you missed out, because you thought that the reason to give the hip exercise was to correct the hip weakness, right? So that's the false precision that I'm talking about here. And I know a lot of you don't like this because it's like, well, you're just you're just throwing stuff on the wall, you know, hoping it'll 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 hit and stick. And I would say the same thing with correcting deficits. You're just hoping that those things are the things that have to change, and and we can't say that. And then the other knock here, and I I, I get this, is it's this idea like. We're just not as special. It doesn't feel as precise because you're just doing anything, or or you're not tailoring it to the to the person in front of you, and you know you're just putting out a recipe. And I would argue that you know that doesn't have to be true. You you could follow a recipe. You could follow a general strength and conditioning program for everyone. And I mean, I would argue if if you could connect with people and do that for the majority of your patients with knee pain, that they got a wicked strength and conditioning program for the entire lower lower body, I bet that they would do amazing. But put that aside for a second, there are other ways to tailor exercise programs to people besides correcting, you know, so-called deficits. And again, you're totally welcome to do assessments and and correct those so-called deficits if you want to. So here's uh, a list, and it, it, it's not exhaustive of how you can uh, tailor exercise to people. I need my glasses. All right, so you know, you lay out the basic idea to your patient. Like, so now they're on board. This is how it's patient-centered. You lay out the basic idea of what you're doing. They have knee pain, right? And we say something like, Your knee isn't tolerating load that well. There's certain activities. You don't like going upstairs. You know, you get pain after three kilometers of running. We can recreate it with knee activities. And then we would say, the knee doesn't function alone. It works with your foot, your calf, your hip. You know, it's it's a complex unit. And we want to build up your knee to do these things. So we're going to build up everything around it, right? We're building up the, the system. What's awesome is there is no one right exercise. There's lots of ways that we can do this, right? So let's explore the ones that you'd be willing to do, right? So you lay that out. Now your patient is your, your partner in, in this, if, if they want to, because they might just say to you, well, you just tell me and I'll do it. And I had someone like that yesterday. I was like, wicked, calf raises, whatever. Clamshells, that's what everyone loves a clamshell. Uh, no, it was a split squat. So uh, the other ways that you could choose this here is now, now we have options that people will buy into, right? So you could simply say, well, let's find the activities that you're struggling with, 
you know, it's stepping up a stair. And now let's do graded activity. We're, we're going to break that down into its parts and we'll build you up to do that. So you could start with a, a regular squat. You could start with a staggered stance squat. You can go into a split squat. Then you're going to stair step ups, you know, and then you might add something in there. Like because it's a one leg activity, you're going to stand on one leg, create a moment in the frontal plane, which will train the glutes a little bit more on the outside of the leg, stand on one leg, lift the other leg up to make it harder, whatever it happens to be, right? So you can just do graded activity to the, to the task that they don't, don't tolerate. And then, you know, what, because they, everything works together, let's throw in some calf raises as well. And now, now we're relatively well-rounded with, you know, three or two exercises. I thought I was gonna say four. Uh, or you use something like, well, you know, what equipment do you have access to? We wanna work your hips, your knee, your foot and they tell you the gym they go to and they say I really like machines I don't I don't like free weights when I did stuff before I like machines I can do it done you know you get a leg press machine you get a leg abduction machine right we, we train heavy there or they say I, I, I don't really care what exercises I do I just want to be a faster runner so here now you're tailoring the exercises to performance-based goals. And you, then you look at the performance literature and running. And so what tends to work? Heavy resistance training, you know, basic compound exercises like the split squat, because that's going to get all of your glute muscles. It's going to get your quads. And then we'd be like, oh, and then we should add some calf exercises because that has evidence for it. And you'll do a heavy resistance training over time. And how would we progress it? Do it faster and have power in there. Wonderful. So that's how we tailored our exercise program to, to the person without saying, oh, no, we have to fix these deficits. We're still building them up to do what they're having trouble doing. Or somebody says, you know, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I just want to be healthy. And you're like, okay, you're a 47 year old woman. You haven't really strength trained before. Your knee hurts. You're doing some running. We would say, what are you missing in your health? You have an aerobic component there, but what are you doing for your bone density? You know, what are you doing to minimize uh, muscle loss as you age? And guess what? What does the program look like? It looks like the same as the performance-based program. We're gonna do heavy split squats, heavy deadlifts, heavy calf raises. We're gonna add some hopping uh, in there as well for, for bone density. So there you created a, a health-based program. And of course you go, go into more details here. Or someone says, I don't care. It's bikini season coming up. Uh, if I want to get ready for the beach, you know, you have someone he wants to get jacked. You're like, well, let's do a hypertrophy program here. And then you, you tailor your exercise prescription above and below where there's pain to create a, a, a hypertrophy program. Or probably more important, you look at coping style, right? We don't just throw exercise at people. We sort of say, you know what? You're already doing a ton of exercises for your knee. You're kind of an endurance coper. We need to back off for a little while and do something else around that area. So we'll do lots of hip stuff and we'll explain that it carries over right, and then it benefits it. And you can, if you want to, you can get mechanistic here and say it could be a general anti-inflammatory. It's possible that via dynamic coupling, you know, strength training the hip might change the load on the knee. Uh, or we would say, again, it's complex, we're not sure. They all work together, but it seems to be helpful. So you can, you go, you can go into the weeds as, as much as you want here. Um, so that's not an exhaustive, you know, explanation of the different ways that you can tailor it. What I'm just saying is like, we, we got to question some of the things that we say sometimes, you know, it's, it, it's not fair to say that so, these so-called impairments are always uh, relevant. We can't say that. So I think we're missing out. I think it's okay to create these general comprehensive programs. And so if you Google me and what I've been arguing for over a decade here is that this is something called comprehensive capacity. So that the general common thread of good rehab, when I see it, is you're going to do something where it hurts, 
you're going to do something above and below where it hurts, and then you're going to do general ex exercise, global exercise, right? Because exercise seems to be helpful. We're not sure of the mechanism, and this is how you cope with this uncertainty. Again, it's the belt and suspenders approach. All right, adios. I hope that helps. See you later. <laughs>